and gentlemen, welcome to yet another episode of uh, InvestSense webinars. Uh, I am Sankal. I represent the business development team at PMSIF World. And we've been doing these series of webinars over the last one year now. And the intent of these webinars is to talk about different portfolios, different market ideas, and uh, different, different uh, opinions from different kinds of fund managers. Uh, the ultimate motive is that we help you, you know, invest better. And that is why we call it Invest Sense as the genesis and keeping in that tradition we have satvik uh, of generational capital he is the executive uh, head at generational capital executive chairman at generational capital and and he also has been a golfer representing india it's very interesting about him and i think a lot of his investment temperament comes from playing golf uh, about his professional career uh, he he was uh, he uh, he was a part of the product team at client associates which manages around 4 billion dollars uh, US uh, four billion US dollars in uh, Indian uh, uh, of Indian families. Uh, he also was one of part, <coughs> part of the four member team at Elara India Gateway Fund, which managed close to forty million uh, US dollars. And he also did M and A deals at Deloitte. Uh, he advised on M and A deals at Deloitte upwards of US dollar ten billion. Uh, he also he was also the co-founder of an app called Fitness uh, Holic dot com. If I uh, I think I got the name right. And right. it was it was uh, a platform aggregating over 150 center fitness centers over the country. Uh, he's been, uh, you know, he's 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 quite he's quite often seen at different different uh, platforms talking about businesses, and uh, you know we welcome him. He will discuss about his perennial fund, which uh, you know tries to create an all weather approach to building you know building wealth and wealth creation in equities. So we will know more from him. Uh, audience, I'm getting no voice comments in the chat. So if you can just give me a yes or no, uh, you know, so that we can go ahead or we will check. So Mr. Sunil uh, says that no voice. Can I get some replies on the chat that you've gotten voice? Also, Satvik, before I begin, let me just give you a little bit of anecdotal, uh, you know, evidence on anecdotal uh, discussion on the uh, on the. Uh, audience that we have today okay voice is fine voice is fine good uh so i asked on chat this is the best bull run i have seen 88 percent says yes no says only 11 percent okay so let's take it head on from here okay we've gotten a lot of messages on the chat saying voice is fine good we uh you know uh we we hope okay someone saying i look less energetic uh, that's not the case. I, I think uh, you will see it in the coming episodes. Uh, sorry, in the coming uh, few minutes. So we'll begin with that. And uh, the audience is Enthu. Enthu, they, they feel that 88% of them feel this is the best bull run. And we are discussing a perennial fund kind of a concept. A perennial, uh, you know, which is often associated with a reverse source. Perennial means that the reverse is not fed by rainwater or any other phenomenon. It is more like an ice glacier melting or something like that, which feeds the river constantly. So that is what we want to talk about uh, in today's, uh, you know, episode. So what do you Satvik? Uh, and let's take it head on. Thank you. Uh, right, right. Uh, so uh, I'll just uh, give a brief uh, about myself and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so can we start the uh, presentation? Satvik, you stop the screen sharing. I'll start with the presentation. Right, right. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I, I would like to give a brief introduction uh, about myself. Uh, Sankalpo gave uh, a lot of it. So I'll just delve a bit more deeper into it as to how this uh, fund came into being and what we are doing. So basically, I was an international golfer uh, playing for India in over 100 tournaments. Uh, then I had uh, this injury on my wrist. So with playing golf, uh, what you realize is you have to be the best each day. So that's what we try to, you know, implement in the investment management field uh, because it's a very uh, competitive field. So we try to be the best each day in whatsoever manner, be it in client interaction, be it in picking up stocks, so on and so forth. So then I founded a health tech platform uh, that was the Zomato for the fitness industry, if we could call it that way. So we scaled it up. It had around 150 fitness centers uh, on it. It was by the name fitnessholic.com. Post that, uh, the investment bug bit, uh, this was around 2014. Then I worked in a couple of organizations 
in deloitte we worked on a lot of uh, ipos and private m&a transactions so that got me into how the mind of how a promoter thinks so all this you know shaped up the investment philosophy how the promoter thinks and how the investment banker would think while building up the book for an ipo uh, what kind of uh, things they look for and how do they want to showcase things to the public uh then worked for a couple of uh, large uh, family offices managing their money uh, in an india based hedge fund uh, and then at one of the largest uh, family offices uh, multi family offices in india where they advised around 3.5 billion dollars uh, interacting with the best minds uh, in the country and uh, that's where i realized uh, how uh, you know what they are looking for is not the highest returns but risk adjusted returns so th that formed the genesis of uh, uh, our firm which is generational capital as well as perennial fund in fact the name itself suggests that we are looking for long term compounding and not the highest uh, returns uh, in the market like safety is the foremost criteria for us uh, along with that uh, i am also a guest speaker at uh, amity international and i also uh am a guest speaker at edlightened that is an edtech startup uh, where i talk about uh, financial freedom and how to attain that so this is a brief about me now uh, jumping to what i think about the macros and the economy so uh, being a bottom up stock picker uh, i try to advise clients not to get lost in the macro data if we see the data from 2007 peak uh, till now uh, the nifty is almost up uh, around 2 2.8x whereas many companies uh, have uh, compounded our capital at more than 100x so our job as fund managers is to identify those perennials which can grow their earnings at 20% irrespective of the macros now the keyword here is irrespective of the macros and i'll show you how we are trying to do that uh the last couple of quarters were one of the best quarters for the indian economy with the corporate profitability to gdp hitting all time highs so ju this justifies uh, why the markets are trading at uh, you know these levels and along with that what difference i am seeing now versus the past previous bull runs is that even in the small and mid cap companies there has been massive deleveraging exercise across all sectors of the economy so you take any sector be it steel sector be it uh, any commodity sector or the uh, consumer part there has been massive deleveraging that has been taken as a, taken as a bad word Uh, right now so now what all this is leading to so there is massive massive consolidation across sectors and true capitalists with market dominance and superb execution are taking away market share so these are the best time for organized players to create immense wealth so we are divide our portfolio into two parts basically growth and defensive so growth part is uh, our technology it services and financials uh, they did pretty well Uh, over the last quarter and defensive uh, we have pharma and consumer where pharma did better than consumer uh now how do i see the markets uh, 10 years down the line i know 10 years is a lot in the future but going uh, going by how uh, global trends have been shifting uh, i can foresee some massive uh, trends which are underway so if we see from 2015 to 2020 how the uh you know uh, the s&p 500 has shaped up to so from almost negligible share of platform companies to almost 50% share in the uh, s&p 500 uh that's what is ha has happened in the usa i see a very similar pattern happening in india so uh, it, 10 years down the line everyone will be a tech analyst mark my words uh, india in gdp is around 2.8 trillion right now and the market cap is ballpark 3 trillion a bit plus or minus by 2000 Uh, 30 if we grow between uh, 5 to 7% uh, real terms nominal terms a bit higher than that uh, market cap would be somewhere between 5 to 6 trillion now this additional uh, incremental market cap of around uh, uh, 2 to 3 trillion i my strong feeling is all most of it if not all would be through these new age tech businesses and we are already seeing proof of concept of that so and they are very important part of the economy uh, some people come to me and say that uh, you know what are they doing they are loss making but zomato and swiggy have more than 4 and 1/2 lakh delivery partners surpassing that of tcs and india post 
could you have thought 10 years uh, back a food delivery company would be having more employees than india post uh, so that is the kind of you know good they are doing to the economy so we are on a constant lookout for these newly listed uh, you know growing tech companies but they should have a road to profitability and finally we have one man uh, to thank to who has made, made it possible so there are no prizes of guessing that it is mukesh dhirubhai ambani so when jio jio launched so now it made a mega shift in the how indian consumer uses internet so india right now has the lowest uh, you know uh, cost per gb of internet since jio was, was launched uh, in the, uh, the the users of internet have grown approximately 4x and now i think they are also launching a jio phone also so that would you know do a lot of penetration uh, into the rural tier 3 tier, tier 4 towns also so now all these uh, consumer tech and you know the tech startups which are coming i think it would not have been possible or it would have been done at a very slower pace if the jio movement was not there so going ahead also we see a lot of d2c brands like mama earth sugar boat uh, emerging through this uh, this movement another trend we are seeing is digital is the new normal so now what is digital the old established institutions which were doing business the traditional way now they are adopting the digital means so for example uh, maruti suzuki out of the 36 steps in its uh, uh, buying process you know 24 has been digitized so uh, dr lal path labs so they are investing a lot on tech and uh, a lot of their collection is now directly happening you know through the uh, app or through the online tech uh, platform Uh, so on and so most of the old uh, age brokerages uh, i am not talking about the zerodas and angels uh, but like motilal ifl uh, they have also shifted mostly to the uh, tech first uh, platform so the future will be tech and which companies can adopt to it uh, now coming to another sector which we like and we have very higher uh, high allocation to so we have around 25 to 30% allocation to the healthcare sector so normally we get uh, asked this question that why such a higher allocation so basically our aim is to compound capital at 18 20% irrespective of where the uh, you know economy is whether the economy is doing bad or good so healthcare is the ultimate anti fragile sector so here i would take an example uh, from a reputed investor who i follow a lot so pat dorsey said most people could uh, survive without coffee or the latest dvd player but healthcare is one of the few areas of the economy that's directly linked to human survival so even if we are in a recession you know the uh, healthcare companies would keep on compounding uh, uh, capital because they are compulsory consumption uh so now some more views uh, on the macros and the liquidity surge which is happening uh so between 1912 and 19, 2008 uh, so this is a very interesting uh, facet uh, of the new era which we are in so the fed printed approximately 900 billion dollars in total then after the global financial crisis uh, between 2008 and 2019 the fed expanded its balance sheet from 900 billion to 3.7 trillion then in the last uh, 16 17 months from the 3.7 trillion it has expanded to 7.1 uh, trillion so what it did not do in the 109 years of its existence it did in the last uh, one one and half years so now this liquidity has to go somewhere uh, so either it can go to gold it can go to cryptos it can go to uh, the equity markets but the question is where in the equity markets so now i try to find some answers uh, as to where it will go into the equity markets so normally liquidity will chase growth right uh, because uh, most of the fis and the uh, large domestic institutions they are looking for growth so now we try to find patterns in the history globally as well as in, as in india and try to see where they will repeat so if we see the early 90s which was the famous harshad mehta boom so it was basically an infra boom uh, when acg and ambuja kind of companies rallied and globally also there was an infra boom uh, then in the mid uh, to late 90s we had the y2k revolution which changed the face of india with the birth of entrepreneurs like uh, narayan murthy 
तो इन इंडिया वी हैड लीडर्स लाइक इन्फोसिस विप्रो वेर एज इन यूएसए वी हैड कंपनीज लाइक याहू माइक्रोसॉफ्ट मल्टीप्लाइंग कैपिटल मोर देन हंड्रेड हंड्रेड एक्स then another trend happened in 2003 to 7 which was the commodity and housing boom where a lot of commodity and housing stocks and their allies like banks and building material companies multiplied capital 100 100 times so the now what kind of trends we are seeing now so currently the trend we are seeing is uh, in in the global context it is the uh, the big tech the fangs which are popularly called like facebook amazon netflix google Uh, apple uh, they are showing a lot of promising growth so in the last quarter if i'm not wrong uh, the top 5 uh, these fang companies at an aggregate grew their sales at 40% and mind you most of them are trading at market caps which are as large as the indian gdp itself so you can Im- imagine the kind of hyperscaling uh, they are uh, seeing uh so we are seeing the same trends uh, happen in india so like platform companies which are there uh, like say an uh, info edge or an india mart uh, they are showing decent growth along with the it services companies going ahead also we see uh, the tech companies uh, particularly doing pretty well now it is up to us to select which out of the tech stocks to pick uh so now coming to what we do at the fund so basically our whole aim is to compound uh, your capital because compounding in the you know day to day affairs is a very under appreciated concept so i would just try to revise uh, some of it so uh, no- normally we try to compound capital at 18 to 24% now at 18% uh, in around 10 years uh, uh, 1 crore would become around 5.23 crore but in 30 years it would not grow at 3x uh, at 15 crore it would grow to 143 crore so a 1 crore would go to 143 crore that is the power of compounding and many people try to forget that you know in the short term uh, volatilities and why we are confident of doing that just based on the earnings growth of our companies so the uh, last 5 years earning growth of our companies has been 20% with an return on equity of around 27% and they are debt free uh, in nature so how do we identify them so uh, over the past 6 7 years while i have been investing globally as well as in india uh, what i have come across is globally all profit pools across sectors uh, are getting consolidated in the hands of a few champion franchises so for example in the global digital advertising industry out of every uh, $1 spent 77 cents would go to google and facebook in fact there is a joke uh, which my startup founder friends uh, say that if i raise uh, uh, say a million dollars out of that at least uh, you know half a million will go to google and facebook so i'm working for them so this is the kind of dominance uh, some of these companies can build and this is not only in the tech sector if we take the animal health sector also around 55% of the market share is concentrated in the hand of uh, five players like the uh, zoetis like an elanco now if we come closer back home the same patterns uh, i can see repeating so for example in the job search market uh, despite a monster uh, multi billion dollar enterprise coming despite linkedin coming a uh, nokri.com Uh, has built its monopoly so it is having more than 80% of the revenue share and 110% of the profitability because at an aggregate level the other people are loss making uh and this is not only in large sectors we see in small niche sectors also these kind of things happening uh like in the amines industry uh there are only two players which are having around 95% of the market share so our aim is to make a portfolio of uh, already established leaders which will provide us consistent returns and the emerging leaders which will provide us uh, that uh, higher returns over uh, our peers and make a very sustainable portfolio of around 15 to 25 stocks so now what is our process so first we uh, identify sectors with consolidated in profit pools uh, then we will use our uh, fraud search uh mecha- mechanics uh, to identify the dubious promoters uh and then we try to look out why this company would be the number 1 or 2 why there would be no impact if any other competitor comes into 
so we look at its uh, capital allocation and its sustainable competitive advantage so how do we identify clean accounts uh, so there is only one way of writing honest accounts and infinite ways of uh, manipulating them so due to my background into uh, buy side and uh, like uh, the investment banking so what uh, i have come across is if uh, i am the promoter of a company which is going for listing or is already listed so i would normally try to increase its sales uh, and profits uh, so at the co and and because the analyst community is only looking at that so for that what i would do if i am not having genuine sales and i am trying to fake them so i'll try to you know uh, shift that to increasing receivables i will try to create fake fixed assets uh, fixed uh, fake current work in progress uh, in fact if we look back in our history and established fraud like a uh, satyam computers so they were showing cash in their books but uh, if we see the other income it did not have uh, any interest income so these are the kind of checks and balances which we do uh, then in case of financial institutions uh, the promoter or the management has the incentive to show high names and consistent growth so if they want to uh, you know uh, write off the nps they do it through the balance sheet uh, through the reserves so even a lot of uh, listed right now also uh, renal banks are doing it uh, which are the favorites of the market um, so uh, then we uh, run a 150 keyword uh, fraud search to again check the intent and vision uh, of the company and the management because in our view as a famous fund manager also said in us in evaluating a common stock management is 90% industry 9% and other factors are only 1% so 80 to 90% of our time in research goes into checking uh, about the company forensics and uh, the management integrity so we try to look at the promoter quality what has been the promoter background uh, what are their unlisted companies whether they are doing most of their lucrative business through the uh unlisted company and this is especially true in the case of uh, mnc companies uh, listed in india uh then whether they are pledging their shares uh then if some litigations or, or court cases are there um right and in this new age of social media and web portals uh, there are some very interesting handles uh which come across uh, doing similar things uh, like a value picker or a nitin mangal who is a champion in forensic accounting and then why they are consistent uh, and continuous resignation of uh, cxo level uh, people basically and why are auditors resigning continuously so now uh, you must be thinking that this is all very monotonous in nature why is he doing that kya milta hai ye sab karke but uh, there are very few interesting findings uh, in it so a uh, leading diagnostic chain ceo and mark my words all diagnostic chains right now are trading at 100x price to earnings so they were found with uh, unaccounted cash uh, they have pledged all their stake in their company and are having real estate transactions uh, very questionable ones left right and center and this is not been acknowledged in a single uh, broker report uh, which uh, i read uh, another leading qsr chain it is again the favorite of the market so they have been pledging their shares putting money into their other loss making businesses and are having very questionable royalty demands uh, a marki fmcd company uh, so uh, they are having very good uh, pedigree from very reputed old industrial house a 300 year old industrial house so they are cash rich but they are taking loans from their promoter entity at 28% so these are very interesting findings basically they help us uh, avoid uh, you know time ticking time bombs uh, which are often ignored in the bull markets so now we come to the quadrangle of wealth uh, creation so out of the 5000 odd companies only around uh, 100 uh, 90 to 100 companies are left for us to evaluate so now what do we look for uh, them so firstly there has to be a large uh, total addressable market because uh, it is the foundation of uh, massive wealth creation because if the large addressable market is not there how will the company grow and how will we as shareholders uh, you know create capital so for example if even if you take a large company like an uh, a titan company so titan tanishk is having around an 18000 crore revenue but the whole market itself is 3 lakh crore and it is growing at 6 7% the whole gold jewelry market 
tanish can easily uh, double its uh, revenues in four or five years so it is basically a la large uh, you know sh shark in the ocean kind of a company then they have traits of you know maintaining that uh, then the we try to look for companies which have a reinvestment runway so just to give you an example of what is a reinvestment runway say uh, i put up a factory today from for uh, 100 rupees then the company the factory generates a 25% 25 rupee profit i can again reinvest it to put another factory and i keep on putting factory after factory after factory so these are companies which can uh, compound our capital at high rates of return and if we get revenue growth uh, 15 to 20% revenue growth with this 20% plus uh, roic then i think uh, we are in for a home run so these for uh, for just for example sake these are companies like relaxo footwear so relaxo what it does is it only earns 10 rupees of by selling one slip it sell the round uh, uh, can you just repeat the last line i think there was some disturbance after uh, relaxo right 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 uh, so right. I, i'll take the relaxo example again uh, right uh, so now what uh, relaxo does, so for uh, reinvestment runway example what does the relaxo do it only makes a 10 rupee per pair profit uh, on uh, by selling slippers other competitors make very higher profits but it now uh, it sells around 18 to 20 crore pairs a year so in that 10 rupee pro per share profit only uh, it makes uh, it does advertising from salman khan katrina kaif siddharth malhotra at such low margins then it again puts up factories so if it it is making 200 crore profit it recently announced a capex of around 150 crore it will again make a 25 30% roic on it so now what it has done is it it has the capacity which is around 8 9x of its nearest competitor in the north region and in this lower end of footwear no one can compete uh, with relaxo so now for, and finally for management apart from their quality and what their background is we look for two two more things one is the capital allocation if the management can allocate capital uh, into business at high uh, roics or it can distribute capital if it cannot re reinvest so for example an abbott india or a nestle uh, or so they cannot invest capital back into the business because uh, their business does not require capital for growth uh, at uh, whatever rate they are growing at between 12 to 15 16% they can do that without capital requirement so they pay out all that uh, cash to the shareholders so this shows uh, the minority friendliness uh, of the company so now what are the competitive advantages uh, of the company because all information and all the forensics and the fraud search we did in the past but all value and all returns i create that will be in the future so in the new age platform and the tech place so you must all already know these are the network effects so what that essentially means is if a platform has the largest number of uh, buyers then uh, or the largest number of sellers the other party will automatically come to it so for uh, an example sake if sankalpo is on facebook and if you all are on facebook if i join some social networking site so i will by default come on facebook only and then facebook can monetize uh, that sooner or later through ads or through paid promotions or uh, other uh, methods so in similar way in tech uh, platforms uh, we see prop, uh, full net, uh, network effects playing out in companies like uh, nokri.com uh, so nokri.com has around 9 crore cvs and now to give some background in the peak of the global financial crisis when uh, job search was considered a very bad thing there was the largest uh, recession so then uh, nokri.com spent on advertising building its brand you all might uh, remember the hari sadu ad at that time right so from that day till now nokri has built a dominant monopoly 
and it has around eight, 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 eight and half crore CVs of job seekers. Now, if uh, I am a, a business which is recruiting entry level candidates, so I would by default go to Nokri because that cost is a very low part of my PNL, uh, right? And I can get the work easily done with very high quality talent. Uh, then in commoditized industries, uh, we look for low cost producers. So, for example, how we spotted uh, DMART was, so we have been tracking Costco and Walmart globally for over a very, very long time. So now what they used to do was, for example, a Costco did not, uh, you know, uh, set up uh, their store in core in a South Extension in Delhi. They would uh, set up their store outside in the outskirts and then they would make a hub and spoke model so one store is in the outskirts then a, a three four more stores would be in the periphery so if i am a unilever or i am a nestle and i am supplying to costco costco can control you know he they have the bargaining power so we were tracking the retail sector for a lot of time in india and we were seeing because the total addressable market is immense so but all the players like you can name them say what more did what subiksha did what a future retail did they were scaling up very haphazardly. So we were looking for a, a player who could scale up, uh, you know, in a very calibrated mar um, uh, order. And then came DMART uh, by the uh, investor who I, you know, uh, admired the most. They uh, did the same model of what uh, Costco and Walmart were doing. They would not uh, put up a store in the middle of Bombay. They would put it up in outskirts and uh, other stores in the periphery. And they would have the everyday low cost offer. So this led to lower costs uh, every day with more consumers coming in and with more consumers coming in, they would have more profitability to lower cost. So this led, leads to a vicious cycle and uh, demand going very profitability, uh, profitably. So now coming to uh, another moat which we see in uh, consumer and pharma companies. So this is of switching costs. So for, for example, so globally, we have been uh, invested in companies like Lonza and Thermo Fisher, Fisher. So these are in the contract research and manufacturing space. So what trend I'm seeing is, say, if uh, I am an Abbott, I am a Sanofi or I am a Novartis, uh, right? I, I'm an innovator. So what uh, the trend is happening is the innovator now wants to only control the brand and the distribution. They do not want to get into the R&D and uh, the process after that they are like if we get a partner of choice who's a trusted partner who can control our ip then uh, we can uh, shift all this work to that uh, to them so they have been you know uh, multi baggers londa and thermo fisher and have been uh, more than 100x so similar kind of pattern we see in companies like sinjin in india so sinjin is kind of a platform so India is like a hub of scientists. So if I am an innovator sitting in USA, I would recruit a PhD scientist there at $250,000. If I go to China, I would recruit them at $1 lakh. If I come to India, uh, I get uh, the same at around $50,000, right? So India is by default becoming a choice of uh, the global innovators. So this is the same kind of boom which happened in the Y2K boom, basically in the mid 90s, when Infosys and TCS, uh, like Infosys from a 500 uh, uh, crore company became many thousand crore company. So the same trend uh, I can see here. Uh, so I call it global innovation and Indian cost. Uh, so then uh, in some consumer brands, we have intangible assets. So if uh, I talk about a company in the global context, uh, there is a company by the name Tiffany's. So uh, it is based out of UK and it is a very premium uh, luxury brand. Uh, so uh, if you purchase uh, jewelry from a normal goldsmith in London, he would take only around four five percent making charge. But a Tiffany's uh, would take around the forty percent making charge, and the prices would be much higher. But the smile on the person's face who is receiving it would be very very different. If for you giving a Tiffany's versus you giving a local goldsmith uh, jewelry. The same uh, thing we saw uh, very early happening in India with uh, Tanishq. So Tanishq normally change, uh, charges around 25 to 30% uh, making charges on the gold jewelry. The same quality gold jewelry 
you can get the local uh, goldsmith at a 5% making charge. But st still, Tanishk is registering 18,000 crore of sales because people are trusting the brand of Titan and that brand gives uh, a sense of pride. So now this has led to Titan's gold business making around a 40% ROC and it is still growing at uh, 18 to 20% in steady state. So these kind of companies are very, very tough to find. Uh, so finally, our do's and don'ts of investment. So we mostly focus on uh, five sectors and these are very strategically positioned. So in a beer market, my consumer and my pharma uh, uh, sector allocation would protect me because these are low volatility, low beta stocks. So we have around, uh, I think, more than 65% uh, weighted to the consumer and the pharma basket. And the other part, which is the consumer tech and the IT services and the financial part. So these would give me the alpha in the beer mar uh, the bull market. So because these are high high growth, hyper scaling businesses. Now business situations we try to avoid. So generally while uh, evaluating a business or a stock, uh, I try to look at it as a business owner. So I generally do not uh, get into companies which are earning, uh, which are not earning economic profits, basically a return on equity less than 15%. Then the business should not be dealing with a uh, government. So basically uh, like an uh, infrastructure company because there the receivables uh, go for a toss. Then we uh, avoid land bank and valuation arbitrage plays. So for example, an XYZ public sector bank is at uh, you know, 0.5 price to book, whereas a Kotak Mahindra bank is at a four and a half time price to book. We would prefer a Kotak Mahindra bank uh, over th uh, that. Then a bad promoter is in, in charge and he is, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, convert. So these are typically uh, things we try to avoid because for us, the safety of capital is of uh, paramount uh, importance. Uh, so these are few holdings. And as Sankalpo uh, mentioned, these are just for uh, educational purposes. So, uh, so uh, tech, we have companies like uh, Nokri.com and LNT Infotech. We also have exposure to NASDAQ uh, because we are very bullish uh, on the uh, FANG uh, companies and the new age tech, which are on the road to profitability. Uh, then in pharma, we have uh, you know, large companies like uh, Sinjin International or mid-cap companies like uh, JB Chemicals. Uh, so on and so forth. And but again, I would uh, try to, you know, uh, reinforce the fact that we are looking for uh, companies which can double their earnings in four, four to five years. Now they can be off and they have to be of defensive tech sectors. Uh, and so we launched the fund on uh, April 1. So it's been four uh, months young or four months old. You can take it that way. So uh, we have been consistently beating the benchmark and like well diversified. We have a 34% allocation to large cap. Uh, mid cap is around 40%. So we are generally not uh, index hugging. And ulti ultimately, now this, this is a very short term uh, performance. So I would try to reiterate that we are aiming for higher returns and lower volatility than the benchmark. And not just because I'm saying that because the portfolio has a much, much superior fundamentals. And in the limited track record also, we are having a beta of around 0.7 uh, and a hit ratio of uh, 75%. Uh, that is 75% of the months uh, we have been beating the benchmark. Uh, so that was it from uh, my side. And finally, like uh, you must be wondering like why perennial, there are so many uh, you know uh, fund houses uh, in the industry. So firstly, like unlike uh, other corporate uh, houses, so most of the families we manage uh, at generational capital at and at perennial have mostly come from word of mouth due to our exceptional performances at our previous organizations here because most of our focus was on uh, risk adjusted returns and return of capital rather than return on capital. Uh, then we are having a fair amount of global experience. So we would be apt to identify this new age tech trends in India uh, and forensic accounting skills. Uh, so we have a couple of CAs who are certified forensic accountants uh, uh, by the ICAI. In fact, Vinayak uh, S.U. So he's heading our forensic practice. So he had uh, he has run models on companies of more than more than 200 companies uh, before we launched this fund. 
and he helps us identify companies uh, using these forensic models and then not only from the fund management uh, aspect we have tried to position this fund uh, from a family office uh, kind of uh, view because of our background of uh, managing money for domestic and uh, international family offices so we have tried to create an all weather strategy that focuses on safety of capital rather than chasing the highest returns uh, while taking you know uh, any amount of risk so yeah i think uh, that was it from uh, my end and sankalpo now will be uh, open for any questions so these right. are our uh, beef right so we have a lot of uh, questions that have come in we will take one by one so uh, before that let's just uh, again reiterate for the benefit of the audience here we discussed a lot of stocks today most of i mean all of which are uh, purely for academic and educational purposes these are not advisory kind of uh, it's not an advisory kind of a session today so please exercise caution uh, satvik or i might or might not have any interest in those uh, stocks so having said that we'll move on so a very interesting question that i will like to take uh, you know the as the first question is i think i'll just check the person who asked this is mr ankit joshi okay so perennial is a concept or you know what you're trying to do is generate <coughs> longer term sustainable kind of returns and what happens is that a lot of these companies a lot of such companies become very expensive multiple wise okay they trade at premium multiples compared to other uh, companies maybe it may i mean across geographies facebook uh, asian pains nestle i mean what's your take on high pe stocks or high valuation stocks in the middle of a amidst a amidst a uh, amidst a multi year pull run and uh, you know what do you think is their capacity to generate returns to investors e during these pull runs right so normally uh, what we at perennial do is so before uh, the fund was launched we had been invested in say a page industries uh, or an aisher motors so generally with these very high quality companies which are trading at very high valuations we try to factor in what is what is the level of growth that is factored in so for example at an page industries the level of growth was factored in was 25% whereas in nestle it is only around you know 12 13% or in asian paints people know that it won't grow at 30% it can grow at 15 20% only so till that amount of growth is maintained we would stay invested in the stock but when we are seeing that that level of growth would not be maintained and you know there are high competitive forces or the macros are such that those companies cannot grow at their previous levels then we uh, try to take an uh, exit call and uh, we and i feel like if the kind of strategy i am kind of trying to run an all season kind of portfolio it has to be a mix and match so we would be having those high quality compounders uh, like an asian paints uh, like a bajaj finance like a dr lal path lab whereas we would try to find those uh, emerging uh, compounders so like a jb chemical right 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 right, right. uh okay so just a follow up question to that it just came in from mr anand the question is what pe you have a discomfort with or we can you know we can have any other valuation metric which makes you a little bit kind of ki chalo theek hai isko rehne dete we'll circle back to this is mm -hmm. there a level uh, like that do you have something in no, mind so i i am a business analyst first and a valuation analyst later so first right. for me it has to be you know the sustainability of the cash flows which has to be there so for example an abbott india compounded its cash flow from i think uh, 40 crore till to 800 crore in the last 12 years or dr lal compounded its capital uh, cash flows at more than 20% over the past 11 years so i think sustainability of those cash flows is very crucial to me even if it comes at a higher valuation uh, so i am okay uh, with that i think that's so a what, very important point you made there we often forget that you know we have to buy the business not the valuation per se right, right. And so what normally we do is so for uh, just for educational purposes say i like uh, dr lal path labs a lot uh, the business right. the franchisee play the high roics but uh, i am not very very comfortable with the valuation so instead of a 7% allocation i would do a 4% and uh, try to do a mi mi uh, you know mix and match in the overall uh, scheme of things and when those valuations cool down then probably i would again take a higher uh, uh, weightage in the portfolio right so uh, satvik today a lot of other fund managers are also coming up with 
you know, their proprietary <coughs> forensic models, proprietary uh, accounting standard models. Okay, so uh, what is it that you think are you are or your team is bringing to the table? And uh, who do you think is the kind of investor that uh, you are looking at when you talk about your perennial fund? Uh, so over to you on that. Right, right. So what we are specifically bringing on the table is so what we have seen in the com competition or rather than competition, we can say, you know, our seniors or our inspiration is most of them uh, do only quantitative forensic accounting. The fraud search, the qualitative fraud search uh, that uh, I have rarely come across uh, anyone doing. So this uh, 150 keyword fraud search and this is based on, you know, what mistakes we made in the previous bull runs, what mistakes our team made in the previous bull runs. So that uh, I have not seen any other uh, uh, Indian fund at least uh, doing. And if I compare myself to what framework I evaluate for a global investor, so say I, I can the frameworks would be similar to what a Terry Smith is doing in UK or what a Pat Dorsey is doing. So those kind of frameworks uh, I relate to more. Right, 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 right. So uh, Satvik, uh, this I know uh, because I know you personally also, uh, you have also been a wealth manager or, uh, you know, you've been managing money for your clients in a non-fund manager way too. Now right. you have also done the arrow of a fund manager. Okay, what is it that you have? Uh, I mean, what is your advice to investors on asset allocation in these times? Okay, uh, come taking from your wealth manager days or your wealth manager experience that you still have. Okay, what is it that you advise to clients uh, during times of a bull run like this? Okay, and how would you evaluate a fund? Or what I mean, typically, how would you? Uh, the, the, this was a part of my last question also. Uh, who do you think is your fund for and how do you probably suggest funds to what kind of investors would you suggest what kind of portfolios or products right so firstly on the asset allocation uh, part so i think when a client client comes to our team or your team so based on the risk appetite we define an, an asset allocation so now what happens is in these times clients tend to be very very optimistic so i have seen two extremes Either clients tend to be very optimistic and a 50% equity allocation guy would go to 70% or they tend to be very pessimistic ki economy to chalni rahi hai, market itni chal rahi hai, sell everything out. So for that, you know, the emotions have to be in control. So we have tried to develop a few models uh, which take the emotion out of the client as well as the RM who is managing the client. So based on multiple like market cap to GDP, price to earning price and they have been very very efficient in tough times like covid also in managing the client's asset allocation because there the human element goes uh, out of picture uh, and secondly if uh, you when you ask me for vanilla asset allocation so i think whatever the asset allocation of the client is he should stick to that but now many cyclical funds many funds which are having exposure to cyclical stocks uh, which we call the low quality stocks, uh, they have risen up a lot. So my uh, genuine advice would be shift, shift out of them to funds which are picking up quality stocks. And normally these would be focused funds, whether on the mutual fund side or the PMS side or the AIS side. The choice is yours, but you should stick to the quality funds uh, now. And secondly, which kind of investors are we looking for or who do we attract basically? So normally whatever uh, families which we are managing uh through the perennial fund so they are mostly looking for the you know the next decade they are not looking for next six months one year return and they are mostly uh promoters of listed companies corporate cxos uh bollywood celebrities uh so they are seriously not like uh, you know caring about what my six month return would be Aapka alpha aya, is fund ne itna acha kar liya. If, that kind of thing and they are looking for safety of capital and even a 15 percent uh, plus compounding would do wonders for them but we are trying to select companies which can compound uh basically double capital at in three to four years right thank you for that that was very detailed and i think uh, you've torn two hats so you know uh, how investors and how clients usually think about it's got a very interesting question again i'll club it with i'll club two questions together that meenal and mr anand asks asked Okay, so uh, how do you look at cyclicals? And uh, the question of cyclicals comes to 
sectors also extends also sectors like PSU, uh, PS, PSU companies, P, uh, PS, uh, public sector banks, uh, probably one of the most troubled sectors like telecom, which, you know, what are your views on that and how would you probably look at these? Because how I understand, at least in telecom, the, the total addressable market size is huge. Okay, right, there are, right. there are, it is, it is virtually kind of a duopoly. Okay, so uh, the reason I take telecom from Minal's question is that it explains a lot of paradoxes probably. So how do you look at such sectors in general? So normally if we look at sectors like a telecom or an airline, right? So mm -hmm. from early 2000s, they have grown their volume a lot. So basically uh, airlines due to value migration uh, from railways to airlines and telecom from for because value migration from the fixed line to the mobile and now the geo movement. But no player is making money. So in telecom, even the best of best went out of business. Airline, there is a famous joke which goes on. If you have to become a millionaire, you start become a billionaire and start an airline because there is no pricing power. The prices are set by the I if I use that word, the you know stupidest guy in the room or the guy who can uh, bear uh, the that kind of uh, losses. Right. So basically, basically, most of them uh, would be setting up the lowest prices, and the other uh, competitors have to go by those prices. So you can't be having pricing power there or bargaining power with the customers. So now, how do you make profits out of that? So most of the te telecom companies have gone out of business and most of the airline companies also have uh, gone out of business. So then Philip Fisher also said that obvious prospects of growth in an industry do, do not mean obvious profits for investors. Right. Right. Uh, and then regarding the PSU question also. So generally What's we try. Right, right, right. So PSU and cyclical. So like. Most of the sectors are uh, shallow cyclicals. So now we uh, try to, you know, prefer shallow cyclicals over high cyclicals. So if I am buying a steel company now, I don't know when to uh, exit that. So then I will be in a lot of trouble and clients uh, won't like that. And in fact, I also won't like that. Whereas if I buy a consumer or a pharma company, high quality company, if something goes wrong, they give me time to exit. Right. And uh, regard to public sector banks, so we have been, you know, uh, tracking them also because we have been invested in uh, leading private sector uh, banks and NBFC like like uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, like uh, Bajaj Finance. So what we realize is the uh, the entrepreneur, there is no uh, entrepreneur there, right? If an Uday Kotak is there, so he is the rich, richest banker in Asia because of his wealth in Kotak Mahindra Bank. Right. Is, is, uh, and a lot of it is tied up to that uh, in a PSU that is not there. So the incentives are not aligned. Right. So you feel uh, as businesses, PSUs are best avoided because, uh, you know, the, the heart and the mind might not be in the right place. OK, right, right. So again, these are not stock advices in the comments. You are getting a lot of uh, things about Rakesh Dundanwala getting into airlines. He won't touch that because that is beyond the scope uh, of this discussion, at least. What I want to ask you is a personal question again. So you think, uh, I mean, uh, you, uh, you have, you've told us about your experience of looking at US companies, okay, investing in new kind of businesses, new platform businesses. What do you think of uh, <coughs> makeup uh, of, a, uh, you know, of these new age companies coming to the public markets? Okay, uh, Zomato, Policy Bazaar, uh, I think at some point in time, PTM is also looking to get listed. What do you think of uh, those companies coming in? And a lot of people describe these as hope trades. Okay. You know, what, what it means is that what I understand what hope trade means is that you're hoping that the revenues will continue growing. And at some point in time, the, the sector will have only one player who drives the revenue, and who drives the sector and has the largest share of the revenue and thus becomes very profitable. So that's a hope. Mm -hmm. And that's a hope trade a lot of people are calling. So what do you have to say about that? young entrepreneur as a participant in the financial markets. So I'm very happy that, you know, companies like Zomato are listing on the Indian exchanges. So can you imagine like say 15, 20 years back, a uh, teacher's son in Muktar in Punjab, he would be running a Decacon, right? That time he, he was in such a state that he would fear for his life. And now he's running one of the uh, largest companies by valuation metrics in India. So it makes me happy, uh, you know, as a market participant. And also these new age companies. So if 
if we talk to the foreign family offices which we interact with regularly so a couple of years back or a year back they used to say where do we invest in india because you don't have those sizable uh, platform or tech companies which can absorb you know uh, large uh, millions and billions of dollars so now at least we are getting that kind of traction Uh, but having said that, uh, of my experience of investing globally uh, in platform companies over past five six years, what I have seen is the sustainable models are those which normally have subscription uh, based uh, revenues, uh, right. right? So ba- basically, once the client is acquired, uh, the client keeps on uh, paying that uh, side for contributing to the revenue, and then uh, obviously uh, most of them are market leaders and are on a road to profitability. so in the indian context if we see so one of the oldest uh, consumer tech startups uh, if you call that a startup now so basically a zomato's investi company like an info edge so you know the customers take 3 4 year kind of uh, uh, packages for their job search engine they make around 50% plus ebitda margin roics are more than uh, 100% so those kind of companies uh, we like and it's not that all companies are loss making in the tech uh, business also let me tell you in the new age platform companies also so there are uh, new age companies like car trade is coming just with an ipo it is a leader in the car search engine it is having very pretty decent roic is 20% uh, ebitda margins you know we have to pick and choose uh, which kind of co- companies come but one thing is for sure uh, 7 8 years down the line more, at least 50% of the nifty would be tech right i agree with you there because i myself am a part and uh, and i we also run a very platform based business and uh, and leverage a lot of <coughs> tech uh, you know uh, to reach people in fact all of this is also on the on similar lines so i concur with you okay there's a huge kind of uh, potential for this uh, kind of businesses to come in and i think this might be the future also okay so we will take a quick comment on you uh on the more uh, you know behavioral side of investors you've been interacting with family offices uh, snis ultra snis who are investors or you know are looking contemplating to invest what do you think is the general mood uh, or what do you think uh, they should be probably thinking about while they invest or their current investments right right uh, so since covid has happened uh, there has been a huge huge shift Uh, even in the old mindset kind of uh, families so normally the families which we interacted uh, with uh, so most of their wealth would be in their business and this would be hundreds of thousands of crore and stock markets uh, and financial assets uh, used to be looked as gamble i'll just put in a few lakhs or a couple of crore then you play with it but now they are considering it serious and the definition of long term has uh, increased so from a couple of years the long term has gone to 8 10 years because they have also realized if they put their money in an uh, you know fd or an rbi bond uh, it would give 6% at best so pre tax also you would compound your money at uh, in 12 years in equity that 14 15% also you are uh, you are getting around 4 4.5x one standard deviation would give you uh, you know 3.5x on the negative side and 6x on the positive side so even your you know semi worst case scenario also is much much better than what a fixed income uh, could give so they are looking for managers who can you know develop that long term kind of mindset not looking at that monthly alphas or you know momentum chasing sticking to their philosophy picking up the best companies which are which can grow irrespective of what the economies are doing and not only in the listed space even in the private equity space we are seeing a, a lot of traction to these kind of uh, managers right thank you so uh, that was again very insightful on what uh, the investors are looking at so we've got a couple of questions more before we kind of wrap up today vivek uh, asks and why i'm asking you this is that you've given a lot of perspective on a lot of sectors uh, one you know very very uh, loved sector right now is chemicals okay right right so you know what do you think of chemicals as a sector and uh, the other question that uh, as of i mean not as a follow up but a separate question but you can answer that after this is what is the kind of drawdowns that you uh, would want your investors to be uh, ready for or what would you say that this is the kind of look boss this is the kind of volatility that you have to come prepared with so right right these two questions so firstly on the chemical sector frankly over the past one and half years uh, i have been reading up at least uh, you know 10 companies 
but I failed to understand them. <laughs> so, so be it uh, alkyl amines, PI industries, uh, Naveen fluorine. I have tried to read about all of them, but since I am not obviously from an engineering or a chemical engineering background, it it is very very tough for understand what goes uh, behind them. And unless I understand the business, how will I forecast what its demand would be, how it would go in right. the future? So we have zero allocation to chemical companies. Uh, and regarding the drawdowns. So one thing you can be sure. So like our pharma and our consumption basket along with gold also. So that would protect us a lot in the drawdowns. And also we have exposure to NASDAQ. So if if the you know the markets fall, we would get a dollar depreciation uh, appreciation benefit also from that. So having said that, when we were managing our uh, personal money during COVID, so in that year also the uh, portfolio was in the positive. But leaving that apart, it would be one of the most low volatility products uh, in the market, which uh, you can see. So that one thing I can assure. Right. So just if I had to ask for a number, I know your fund came a little bit later than the COVID uh, crash. Uh, what is the kind of drawdown you would have envisaged for your fund in March 2020 had it been in existence? Right, 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 right. So, so actually, the same portfolio only we were doing it for the personal portfolio, and we have been maintaining a little track record uh, of it how we are doing it month on month. So, right. in that year, uh, we were up around nine percent in in that March to March year. When the uh, indices were uh, down, so that was mostly due to the pharma stocks like, say, a Dr. Lal or an Abbott uh, or a consumer stocks like Nestle doing well. But again, there are no guarantees in this. Right. right. So but, this just for the more uh, broader purpose of uh, discovering or knowing more about your fund. Okay. With this last right. question, I think it's a very interesting question. We will wrap up today's session so you are a young investor i am also uh you know a professional with around six seven years of experience so uh as professional this is probably the first major bull run that we are seeing okay and uh a lot of new investors are coming into this attracted to this bull run uh are coming into the markets lakhs and crores of demat accounts are opening or you know are open so what is your advice and what is your learning or what how are you proceeding into the market as a young fund manager uh you know can you just share your advice or your learnings for, uh, to the benefit of these new entrants in the stock markets right right so uh, i have been investing from around you can say late 2013 14 so basically one basically a couple of beer markets uh, i have experienced in personally and obviously i've read about, about patterns of what works and what doesn't so normally what happens right now is we would see a lot of uh, sectors which were not doing well now suddenly rallying and you know a lot of low quality stocks uh, rallying and especially on fund managers like us there is a lot of pressure so for example if i would be having a nestle india or an abbott which hasn't done you know move for the last one year suddenly my clients would uh, come up to me and ask that boss uh, kya chal rahe? markets have doubled why don't you go into that chemical stock or you know that uh, API stock or metal stock? But again, those kind of temptations you have to resist because you are there for the long term game. And you know, these kind of uh, things pretty much vanish when the market's correct. In fact, in the last couple of days only, I was getting a lot of DMs on Twitter. Ki, uh, kya kare market mein? Uh, you know, uh, there were a few five percent correction in the mid and small cap indexes. So for people who have not seen proper, uh, you know, beer markets, it is best to uh, go with, you know, tried and tested uh, compounders. And obviously everyone learns uh, through their own journey. Right. Right. So that's very interesting and very inciting and insightful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on the call, I would I have shared the link for uh, Satvik's uh, website. Uh, you, you guys can visit and check out his portfolio for any queries. Queries you can always write to us. You can book a call with PMSIF World, and uh, we can help you reach out uh, to Satvik or help you choose investments in general. That's it from our side. Do uh, you know uh, for more such videos? You can look at uh, on our website or you know subscribe to our YouTube channel. We keep doing this every Friday. Thank you, Satvik, for being with us. It was a very insightful concept, and uh, you know a lot of new things came our way. Uh, so over to you for any closing notes or we uh, and then we uh, wrap up today's session. Right. No, so it was very insightful, uh, you know, and interacting with you and the clients which were there. And so again, one thing I would try to reiterate it. Don't go after returns this time. Try, try to focus on safety of capital. 
and both from a family office manager as a and as a fund manager that doesn't mean going into debt or uh, debt or cash that means going into safer uh, uh, equity strategies so this would be my limited uh, closing remark right thank you satvik thank you to the thank audience you. we hope to see you soon again thank, thank you, you.